As our official kickoff to SEP Tandy, we're covering the computer that started it all for the computer giant Tandy. It's the TRS-80 Model 1, and it's right here on Vintage Geek. Just a reminder, if you like vintage computers and vintage tech, be sure to like and subscribe. It's going to help us a lot as we grow, and I encourage you to become a Vintage Geek member. You can do that at our website at VintageGeek.com. In the mid-70s, Radio Shack really had no concern over microcomputers. They were doing quite well in their business of selling home stereo components, CB radios, and more. In fact, I read at that time that CB radios accounted for about 20% of their sales at their stores nationwide. One of the employees of Tandy, Don French, was interested in the Altair computer which had become popular among hobbyists at the time. He apparently got his hands on one and really liked it. So we went to John Roach, who was the VP of manufacturing for Tandy, and pitched the idea of coming up with a Radio Shack or Tandy computer. Now, at the time, there wasn't a lot of interest in this idea initially, but the conversations continued to grow, and they looked at some other computers and models that were available at the time, and eventually got a presentation to do a small demo model of a computer similar to what you see here to President Charles Tandy. The funny story about this for me is that apparently during the demonstration there was a program that was written in tiny basic that would allow you to enter a salary as part of some accounting routine charles tandy entered the number 150,000, which apparently was his salary as the ceo of tandy and it actually broke the computer it was not capable of handling that level of numbers so they had to move to a floating point math which could accommodate 150,000. but apparently tandy liked it enough to continue with the project and by 1977 tandy had come out with their their official first computer, the TRS-80 Model 1. Of course, they didn't call it the Model 1 then because there were no other models to compare it to. It was simply the TRS-80. Now, the 80 was in reference to the Z80 processor that was used inside the unit, and the base model of the computer came with 4K of RAM, which obviously sounds very tiny compared to what we're used to today, but we're talking about 1977. There really wasn't much else available on the market at all. The PET was part of the original Trinity as well as the Apple II, but Radio Shack had the advantage of having a very good price point to start out with. You could get a similar arrangement to what we have here today, including the monitor and the computer and a cassette recorder for just under $600. And that was a killer deal for the time. This kind of opened the door for hobbyists and people to get into computers that really wouldn't have otherwise. They really didn't project this computer to sell that well. But in the first year, the demand for this computer got so high after the word got out that it definitely exceeded 50,000 units. And over the course of its life, over 100,000, and of course it paved the way for all of the other Tandy computers to come, including the Model 2, the Model 3, the Model 4, the Color Computer line, and so many others. This is where it got its start. I really want to dive into the system, study it a little bit, and see if we can run some programs on it and get that full feel of what it was like to work with one of the very first microcomputers. Let's take a closer look at the TRS-80 monitor. I want to mention first and foremost, this is a monochrome monitor or display, so it's going to show with kind of white text on a black background. This monitor was an RC design and they actually removed the RF section or the TV tuner section to work with the computer. In these initial designs there was a lot of problems with RF interference so the FCC had some pretty strict guidelines about how much RF you could emit in a device that was designed to go in the home. So by removing the RF section in the monitor they could remove a lot of potential for that interference and basically slide by the FCC regulations. So a good partnership they had with RCA there to make something work like this. The design of the monitor itself is pretty straightforward. I do want to note that the weight of the monitor, it's actually pretty lightweight. Um, there's not much to it and you can carry it around pretty easily. There's not a whole lot to discuss on the front panel of the monitor. I do love the TRS-80 badging, and we have, of course, a power switch. We have a couple of controls for brightness and contrast. There's a cable that comes out of the front of this that goes directly into a DIN-type connector on the back of the TRS-80 computer. One thing that's also important to note about this monitor is that there is no speaker of any kind in it. Now, I don't know if the original TV design had a speaker. I presume it did, probably under the area where that TRS-80 logoing is, but they did remove that for this design. So there's no inherent sound output coming through the monitor from the TRS-80. Taking a look at the back of the monitor, again, very basic, not much to really discuss here. There is a manufactured date stamp on the back. In the case of our monitor, it was from 1978. We also have a couple of controls in the back that are for adjusting the vertical hold and the horizontal hold. Now we have the actual TRS-80 Model 1 computer itself, kind of continuing in that theory of simplicity by design. This is a very compact unit, the CPU 
and everything is in the same housing as the actual keyboard. So you could fit this just about anywhere. Unfortunately, it did not have the capability of plugging into your home television set as they did with the later color computer series. This unit is, again, pretty lightweight. You can carry this around pretty easily. The keyboard design is very standard and very comparable to modern keyboards. There were a number of complaints about the bounce effect of the key. So basically, when you would press a key, you would sometimes get that kind of phantom effect where you'd get multiples of the key showing up on screen. There was some fix you could get from Tandy for that particular problem. And for the TRS-80 fans out there, it doesn't seem like it was a limiting factor in doing tons of various programs for the system over the course of its life. I do appreciate the fact that the inter key is a separate color so it's the white with black text rather than the opposite so that really makes it stand out on the field of keys and having the black keys with the white type is kind of cool in itself I, I do like the overall appearance and, and look of this keyboard the keys themselves feel fine there's no real issue with them they don't have a click or anything like that but they do have full motion which is nice there is an LED which indicates power to the system it's nice to have some kind of visual feedback that the system is on just in case the monitor isn't working for some reason and then on the right right hand side of the keyboard you have the full TRS-80 microcomputer system badging which takes up a lot of real estate but does look pretty cool for a Tandy fan like myself. You've got some ventilation on the rear section of the case here. I assume that most of the components inside this did provide some heat so uh, having a way for that heat to get out of the system would have been important. Looking at the back of the system and starting at this side we have uh, three DIN connectors. Now the first one is labeled tape and that's going to be for the cassette player. We don't have the exact uh, first version of the cassette player that Radio Shack used, but we have one that will certainly work in the same way. The next connector we have on the back is for the video. That's actually going to accommodate the five pin plug coming directly from the TRS-80 monitor. And of course, the following plug is for the power. That's what's going to deliver the power from the separate kind of brick unit that came with the TRS-80 that provided the necessary power supply voltages for the system. Directly next to that is a push button power switch. And I was a little bit surprised at how small the power switch is, considering that it's kind of in this recessed area of the back plane. I noticed the first few times turning the system on and off that it's a little bit awkward to kind of get your finger back in there. It definitely works and it achieves the purpose it's set out for. Then if we move across the back to the other end, we do have an edge connector. Now this was for later expansion and definitely accommodates the expansion interface. We do have the TRS-80 expansion interface here in the museum, but I'm not going to be covering that today. I want to go into the original basic model of the system, the very first incarnation of the Model 1 today. So for now, all we need to know is that that's where the expansion happens and how you could add memory and other peripherals. But uh, that's pretty much it for the actual base computer unit. So I guess next we need to connect things up and see what we can accomplish with this TRS-80 Model 1. Let's give it a try. We'll start by powering on the monitor and then we'll power on the computer itself. We've got the original prompt here for memory size. This particular Model 1, as I recall, has 16K in it, so it may have had one upgrade done to it at some point. We've got a ready prompt right out of the gate here. This is the Level 1 manual, and it has a lot of great example programs, explains how basic programming works, and I love the way they do it with kind of the humor mixed in and some of the cool cartoon images of the little computer dude running around. But uh, I want to try a sample program here to see what the basic programming is like on the Model 1. I found one in the book that's going to display some kind of a 24-hour clock so I figured we would start with that and see what that looks like on screen so let me go ahead and get this keyed in here now already the the keyboard is not perfect it's registering pretty well there's been a couple of uh, key presses so far that are a little bit uh, that there's that echo I put in the zero once and put it in twice three and four are a little bit rough here so I'm gonna have to go ahead and use uh, twos 21 because we don't have three and four working properly definitely see where people were a little bit upset about the keyboard bounce it is a little bit challenging we're making it through so now we've got our different loops for hours minutes and seconds totally makes sense and then we're going to use those loops to print something so that's gonna print hours, minutes, and seconds. They'll be separated by colons, that makes sense. Again, these positions are not gonna match because I'm using different numbers as I don't have a working four key at the moment. The point of this lesson in the book was to say what the print at means, which as I understand it is basically picking a point somewhere on the grid of the screen, and it's actually making it display text in that particular point. Let's see what happens when we run this. 
And obviously this is based on the clock speed, so this is probably not gonna be a super accurate clock display as it's basically just counting seconds by the actual processor speed. But I see what it's doing here. We've kind of got a scrolling display. I assume it's gonna continue to scroll as it moves on, and it is. We're talking about, you know, basically 10 lines of code here, so this isn't uh, a lot of complexity, but uh, certainly gets the job done for what it's trying to show the point of here. This would be different if it would have used the location that it actually specified in the book. I'm using 207 and 27. They're showing 407 and 470, which I'm guessing would have been closer to the other side of the screen. Decent little first program here. Let's see what we can do with some of the prepackaged software via cassette. I want to start with some educational software um, because this is one of the areas that Radio Shack really saw as an opportunity to get in front of kids in the classroom. So let's go ahead and put this tape in the drive. This, of course, is a pretty slow bit rate. 500 baud is about as slow as it gets. Loading from cassette with the early Radio Shack models was a great time to go make yourself a cup of coffee. All right, we've got the ready prompt, which means that the tape is done loading. It stopped the transport on the tape machine. I'm very interested to see how I do with a math tutorial program when I don't have access to the number three or four, but uh, we will see what happens. Basic math facts drill, division and multiplication. So that's a cool little graphic to start out the game here. Looks like we can choose between multiplication and division. So let's go ahead and do multiplication. Each lesson has 20 facts. You must score 85% or higher to move to the next lesson. Well, let's see what we can do here. Please type your first name, Vintage. We'll start with lesson one. Welcome to Beat the Computer. Oh no. <laughs> oh wait, it worked. Things are looking up. It's looking good so far. I'm glad the three is starting to work a little bit more reliably now. Ooh, that enter key is a little rough though. I got four to register. It turns out all we needed to do is do some math drills. What happens if we get one wrong? Oh, okay, so it just tells you the correct answer. I like the resolution on screen though. It looks like these are actually bigger characters than the normal text. Now if I can get it to actually put a four on the screen again. Oh, maybe this was a one time. Oh, <laughs> there's a timer too, interesting, okay. Come on, I'm trying. Oh, it's just gonna stay on this forever, isn't it? Really does not wanna let me put in that four again. Well, we may be foiled on this particular exercise if it can't move on. Well, regardless, the math drill does work. I like the way it looks on screen. It's very clear, very simple. I could see where this would be, you know, pretty useful in a school environment. I'm gonna break out of this program for now and we will go on to our next piece of software. In our collection, we're fortunate to have a couple of the Radio Shack Games Pack software packages that basically came with a couple of different cassettes. The one I wanna take a look at specifically today is Meteor Mission 2. According to the box, six UASA or Universal Aeronautics and Space Administration astronauts have crashed on Philo 7, a large gravity-bearing asteroid. They're waiting for your rescue shuttle to snatch them from their rocky perch, but a steady stream of asteroid fragments drifting between your shuttle and Philo 7 suggests that there may be endings other than happy ones. So I'm going to hit play on the cassette recorder. I'm going to type in Meteor and it does start loading the tape. Oh, interesting. So it's actually gonna load the load screen as it goes. Oh, now see, this is very cool. They're actually giving us a countdown timer for how long it takes for this game to load. Now, three minutes is a long time, but it's a lot better when you have some kind of indicator telling you what's going on instead of just the flashing cursor. Oh, look, help! <laughs> Nice. I like the explosion. That's really cool. Meteor Mission 2. It says you can press clear to start game. We'll do one player. I seem to remember reading that there's an R command. My rocket is in the ship, and if I hit R, it's going to drop that rocket. Ha! Nice. Look, little dude's coming over here to get in the rocket ship. All right, now I have to get the rocket back, but how do I fire? Oh. <laughs> A little bit too delayed on firing the rockets. Let's release it here. All right, we're... We've got it. Our dude's getting in it. Can I steer? Oh, I can steer. Great. Come back, rocket ship. I like how you don't really have any control over the upward movement. You just have control over the left and right, from what I can tell. Now, I'm going to have to really get over here quickly. Oh, no! <laughs> it's so close. Right, maybe I can shoot this. Can I shoot this asteroid? Yes. Gotta get over to the ship in time. I don't even know if I can blow up those bigger asteroids. Oh, no. Oh, no. Come on. Can I go up faster? Come on. <laughs> Ah! Oh, well, my score is one of the top 10 highest scores of today, so <laughs> fantastic. I do like this, so it's uh, it's very simple. Oh, here's the instructions. Play until all ships are destroyed. Okay, so you're supposed to destroy all the rest of them anyway. Let me try this one more time. Here comes the dude. He's going to get in the rocket. I wish that you could control the rate that it goes up and down. I suppose that would make it less challenging, though. Okay, I've cleared a path. If I can just keep them away long enough. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it. Ha-ha! Ah, dang it. 
apparently you can't shoot any missiles to the side. But I feel better about that one. At least I got one of the rockets into the main ship. I have to say overall that I'm pretty impressed with Meteor Mission. It's a fun little game. I love what they've done with very limited capability on the TRS-80 Model 1. Things move pretty well, honestly, and just the, the simplistic firing the missiles and, you know, slowing your rocket down upon approach to the landing pads is pretty cool. The little stick figures that come and jump in the rockets has an early arcade feel to it, and uh, it's pretty impressive. Next up, we have the iconic Sega arcade game Zaxxon. Now, this is the Model 1 version of it. I really don't know what it's going to look like. Another example of an early arcade game being ported over to the TRS-80, and uh, let's see how it does with it. wonder what kind of load screen we're going to get with this one. The official Zaxxon by Sega. Again, it's got a countdown timer for the loading. Really curious what this port of Zaxxon is going to look like on the TRS-80, but uh, I'm impressed so far. So it looks like the first thing we've got to answer here is the skill level. And if you've seen any of my previous videos, you know I'm going to be starting out with a number one here. All right, so, oh, cool. So this is kind of that side to side, almost an angled display. How do I fire? Okay, space bars fire, got it. <laughs> These graphics are so rudimentary. I, I love it though, like it's, it's very, oh no. All right, I'm down to two ships. Look, it's even got a little shadow of the ship on screen. It's pretty cool. Is that an enemy? I can't tell what, what are enemies and what is actually the, oh, I shot something. Is that a wall? Yep, that's a wall. I mean, for what it is though, it, it's pretty impressive. I love the fact that they put a little shadow of the ship. Am I supposed to be able to shoot these guys? Because nothing seems to be happening. Oh, you can go up and down too. It's an important mechanic to be aware of. Right now I'm at full height, so I can make it over this wall. It's a little disjointed though with the high and low being at the different opposite side of the keyboard as the left and right. It does make it a little bit challenging. See, I don't know if I need to go further down. Okay, I made it over that wall. Again, movement looks pretty good, but I can't really tell where the other ships are from a... Oh, yes, I got one. <laughs> I must have been at the right height. I know a lot of you out there are making fun of me right now because you probably played Zaxxon hundreds of times. I've only played it once or twice, and I've definitely never seen it look quite like this. Not bad though. The height thing is really a problem for me. I, I just can't tell where things are supposed to be. Am I supposed to be shooting that? Oh, <laughs> well, I guess that answers the question. Did not get that one. I love what they've done with it with a limited graphics display, being able to show something kind of in that particular aspect, that kind of side scrolling type of perspective is pretty cool and definitely something I've not seen in an early computer like this. I like the Zaxxon feel on the system, even though it definitely has its limitations. I'll have to play that a little bit more and get a little bit more used to the depth perception and the height to try to be able to fight some more enemies, but a very cool piece of software overall. So that's the first look at the TRS-80 Model 1. And I have to say, I'm pretty impressed. Now I have an affinity for Radio Shack products and certainly the Tandy line. This is no exception. I love the way it looks. I love the way that it feels overall. And it, it just feels kind of home to someone that's used to things like the color computer. And I'm very pleased with the system that we have here in the museum. Hey, want to remind you, if you like vintage tech, vintage computers like the TRS-80 Model 1, if you're a SEP Tandy fan, be sure to like and subscribe. We do videos like this each and every week. We also have our website, which is full of all sorts of extra goodies. We've got code snippets. We've got extra videos that aren't available on YouTube and a whole lot more. I would encourage you to become a Vintage Geek member there. It's all at VintageGeek.com. Until next time, I'm Aaron, and this has been Vintage Geek. Vintage Geek.